as soon as you shut the music, people get really quiet, like what's going to happen next. I have no magic tricks, I assure you. Well, good evening and welcome. My name is Louis Grosso and I manage the Media Studies program here at Mercy College. I'm very happy to be here with you celebrating our 33rd annual Quill Awards ceremony. Each year at the Quill Awards, we celebrate accomplishments of students for excellence in coursework, a program alum for their success in the field after graduation, and a professional for their overall career achievements. The Media Studies program offers a Bachelor's of Science degree in Film and Culture, Journalism, and Radio and Television Production, with additional course sequences in Public Relations and Performance. It is a fine program where many students have gone on to successful careers in media. But at this time, I'm honored to invite the 12th president of Mercy College to address you. Please give a warm media studies welcome to President Timothy Hall. Well, good evening, you all. It's great to see you this evening. Uh, this is one of the exciting times in any college's life where there are award ceremonies going on virtually nonstop. I have another one right as soon as I leave here that I'm going to, and they'll be all during the week. Now, before this semester started, I might have congratulated you on your talent that's produced the awards that you'll be recognized for tonight, but I actually read a book this semester uh, that says something contrary to that, and I wanted to mention it to you. Uh, I guess an audience of folks attending a Quill Award, at least some of you know about the social media site for readers, right? Do you know Goodreads? All right, All right. where well, we keep track of our, uh, of our reading. So one of the books I read this semester is by Anders Ericsson, a psychologist, and it's called Peak. It's about the science of expertise. There are people who are spending their lives studying what it is and how it is that people are great in, in particular areas and what makes them great and how that experience feels like. There's a Czechoslovakian psychologist named uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi who's an expert in the concept of flow, what it means to really be in your game and how that feels. But anyway, Peak is a book I read and Peak says this, it says there's no such thing as natural born talent, not a dime of it that none of you were naturally born with talent who are gonna be recognized here tonight, that what happened is you along the way were introduced to the concept of deliberate practice. And it was deliberate practice across a long period of time that produced the results that we recognize here today. Uh, there's some other people who are saying similar kinds of things. You might've read a book by uh, a guy named Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers, which says something comparable, which says the reason the Beatles were great was because they put in 10,000 hours of practice in Hamburg before they came, came back to Britain. And the reason that Bill Gates is a great computer program is because things sort of worked out for him so that he had an enormous amount of time, like 10,000 hours, to work with computers when he was growing up and a teenager. So, if all of that is right, and increasingly I believe that it is right, the thing that I'm congratulating you this evening for, and that I'm congratulating other students around the college for, is for the deliberate practice that you put in, in writing, or production, or broadcasting, or journalism, whatever it was, that's the thing that brings you here tonight. And I'll tell you this, it's, that's the thing that will probably take you to the next point in your life, and the next time that you're recognized around this table, and it will continue on as you go along. That it isn't talent so much as it is simply the fact that you deliberately practice that produces these results. So I'll leave you with the line from Longfellow that I learned when I was a teenager and sort of accompanied me along the journey of life. Longfellow said, the heights which great ones reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were toiling upward in the night. So let me welcome you to the fellowship of night toilers. I hope I see a lot of you at night uh, toiling, studying for a test, preparing for a paper while other students have moved on to other things because that will carry you very, very far in this life and make Mercy very, very proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you, President Hall. 
Born in Westchester, New York, Thomas Hauser has come quite a way from the small town of Largemont on the east side of the county. His writings cover both fiction and nonfiction, with subject matters ranging from political and social to a myriad of boxing-related books and various fiction novels, including, uh, including a children's story. His first major work, Missing, about a young writer who gets caught up missing during the Chilean Revolution in the early 1970s, was developed into a major motion picture starring Jack Lemmon and Sissy Spacek in 1982. In fact, it was after this when he gained approval and understanding from his mother about his career change. <laughs> Before all, however, Mr. Hauser invested time educating himself at Columbia undergraduate and then law school. He tells me he's always enjoyed writing and doing the research. This interest came hand in handy, of course, when he clerked for a federal judge and again later on as a litigator for a Wall Street firm. Mr. Hauser says he enjoys creative writing because it allows him to explore the subject without strict boundaries. He claims it's the main source, uh, sorry, he claims it's the main source of his enjoyment with writing. And he should know because his books have been translated into 18 languages, including articles written for the New Yorker, uh, the New York Times, and a number of other publications. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to present the Quill Award for Professional Achievement to Mr. Thomas Hauser. Got a picture? Thank you. It's very nice. Got a picture? Thank you. Mark Twain, can you hear me in back okay? okay? Mark Twain was once asked for the secret of his success as a public speaker, and he said, always remember your audience will appreciate a bad short speech more than a good long one. <laughs> so with that in mind, I will be brief. Uh, we're living in a time when responsible journalism is under siege. And what I'd like to do with you this evening is share some thoughts on how to become good journalists. Number one, challenge every word you put on paper. And to digress for a moment, I spent a lot of time with Muhammad Ali. I was his official biographer for about 10 years. I was in the inner circle. And one of my favorite Muhammad Ali stories dates back to the 1970s when he was in his glory years. He'd just beaten George Foreman to regain the heavyweight championship of the world. He was the king. He was on a shuttle flight that was readying to take off from Washington, D.C. to New York. And the flight attendant came over and said, Mr. Ali, please buckle your seatbelt. Ali looked at her and said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. <laughs> and she looked at him very sweetly and said, Mr. Ali, Superman don't need no plane. <laughs> now, I mention that because there came a time when Lonnie Ali, Muhammad's wife, was asked to write a chapter in a book about Muhammad. And she asked me to read through it. And I started reading, and the first sentence was, Muhammad is one in a million. And I said, no, Muhammad is not one in a million. If he was one in a million, there'd be 350 others just like him in the United States. And there aren't. You can say he's unique. You can say he's sui generis. You can say he's one of a kind. But challenge every word you put on paper, because they have meanings. Number two, keep in mind that oftentimes, your readers only know what you put on paper. If you refer to Barack Obama, you don't have to say former president of the United States. People will understand that. But when you get into the unfamiliar, unless you put it on paper, people don't understand. They don't know. And my best lesson for that came years ago, I wrote a spy story set in the mountains of Nepal called Hanuman's War. I got 55 rejections on it before I found a publisher. And as often the case with these rejections, they're not very helpful. Uh, you know, very often you hear, you know, we love this, but it doesn't suit our needs. There was one day when I got two rejection letters, 
One said the book needed more on Nepalese politics, and the other said the book needed less on Nepalese <laughs> politics. Uh, but th there was one thread that went through a lot of them, which is the people who were reading the book, the editors, did not like the main character. They thought he was surly, they thought he was unpleasant, and I said to myself, you know, don't they understand how much he's suffering? And then I realized, no, they don't, because I didn't put it on paper. Number three, be creative. Try to take a subject that hundreds if not thousands of people are writing about and find a different angle to it. One of the examples I use on that, when John Kennedy was assassinated, you had thousands of journalists coming from all over the world to write about the funeral. Jimmy Breslin went to Arlington Cemetery and interviewed the man who was digging the grave for President Kennedy. That's a different angle, that's good. I was at a Don King press conference, and I think you all know Don King, the promoter. Uh, I was looking for a different angle to write. My mother was 80 years old at the time, so I brought my mother to the press conference and wrote, my 80-year-old mother meets Don King, <laughs> which was an experience for both of them. Uh, if I was writing an article about Tiger Woods today, you know, what, what would I do? I mean, we all know about Tiger Woods' golf career. We all know about his womanizing. One thing I haven't heard a lot about is, you know, we all think of Tiger Woods as African-American. And yes, Tiger Woods' father, African-American. But his mother is Thai. And I've seen virtually nothing about that. How much is that part of his identity? What does he think about that? What is his identification there? Look for different angles to be creative. Number four, set things up in advance. I didn't just show up at Don King's press conference with my mother. I called up Don King's publicist before I went to the press conference and said, this is my idea, can I bring him? Yes, we'll credential her. Then they brought Don over to meet her and spend some time there. All of that goes to rounding out the article. Number five, just voicing an opinion doesn't make you a journalist. Back up your opinions with facts. Number six, fact checks. Don't fudge dates. Don't say, you know, something happened in the early 1980s when you can pin it down. With the internet today, fact checking is easy. There's no reason not to do it. Number seven, don't play games with New York Times versus Sullivan. And for those of you who aren't familiar with New York Times versus Sullivan, that was the first in a series of libel cases that established protections for journalists today. And where the law stands today, if you are writing about a public official or a public figure or a matter of public interest and you say something defamatory about a person and that person sues for libel, the burden is on them to prove that what you wrote was false and that you wrote it with either knowledge of falsity or serious doubts as to truth or reckless disregard of truth. Now, even within that framework, you can play games. You can say almost anything. I could write an article that makes it look like Mike Pence is a child molester. If I was a journalist in Washington, I could say I was at a briefing at the White House. Mike Pence was there. Somebody's eight-year-old daughter was in attendance. And I didn't like the way Mike Pence was looking at her. It made me very, very uncomfortable. So I went to Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, and said, I want to ask you something. Is Mike Pence a child molester? There was a long pause, and Mitch McConnell said, I never heard that before. I was thinking about that afterwards, and it struck me Mitch McConnell didn't deny it. He just said he'd never heard it before. You can build on that, you can build on that. It's all garbage. You might be able to get away with it. 
There are people in today's news world that do it and get away with it. Don't, because it makes you a lousy journalist. Number eight, journalism is about building relationships. And if you want to develop sources, if you want people to feel comfortable talking with you, you have to be straight with them. Now, I have a rule with all the people, and I interact with a lot of people and a lot of different disciplines. A lot of them are partly social relationships. And my rule in dealing with these people is anything you ever say to me is off the record unless I specifically ask, can I use this? And you specifically say, yes. It's important to develop trust. If you do, a lot more people will trust you. Next, respect confidences, but don't hide behind them. Don't make stuff up and say that it came from an anonymous source. You know, I watch people sometimes on TV, and I feel like shouting at the screen, hey, you know, those little voices you hear inside your head are not sources. <laughs> Ten, make your quotes honest. Now, that doesn't mean you have to quote verbatim every word. You know, if, if you're talking to somebody and he says, well, I was thinking, you know, it seems to me that, um, you, know, you can take out the you knows and the ums. When you pick up the New York Times and read it each day, you don't see a lot of dot, 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 ellipses between quotes. But quote as accurately as you can. Number 11. Confront the objects of your criticism before you write about them. If you have somebody, something negative to say about somebody, call them up ahead of time. Give them a chance to respond. Number one, that's a matter of simple fairness. Number two, it's a good defense in case somebody sues you later on. Number three, you might learn something that changes your thinking. Maybe you'll say, hey, that person's right in the direction I was going and was wrong. Number 12, remember that you're writing about people who have feelings, just like you do. When I write something, I always give it at least one run through where I read through it and I say, okay, how will everybody who is mentioned in this story feel about it when they read it? Now, some of them might not be happy and I understand that. But at the very least, if that person confronts me afterwards, I want to be able to look them in the eye and say, that's what I thought. I don't want to say, oh, it was taken out of context or you're reading it the wrong way. All of you have feelings, they all have feelings. Thirteen, keep faith with your subjects. Uh, most of you probably know Marv Albert, the sports commentator. Uh, a lot of you probably aren't old enough to really remember what he went through a while ago. Marv Albert was on top of the world as a sports commentator. He was doing NBA basketball. He was doing NFL football. He was sportscasting royalty. And then a woman went to the authorities in Virginia and said that she had been in a hotel room with Marv Albert They'd had an ongoing sexual relationship, and he had bitten her. What was really behind that was Marv had had a fairly adventurous sex life. And uh, as part of his relationship with this woman, he didn't draw blood. It was play biting, whatever. Uh, Marv then told her that he was engaged. He was going to get married to a woman who he's been married to now for probably about 15 years. And he was ending the relationship with this woman, and she was angry. So to punish him, she went to the authorities. An over-aggressive DA in Virginia said, well, hey, let's indict this guy for assault. And then the you know, SHIT hit the fan. Uh, he became tabloid fodder. Another woman went to the press and said that she'd been working as a maid in a hotel and saw Marv in a room with a young man, and Marv was wearing woman's panties. Next, a dominatrix was found dead in her apartment 
on the west side of Manhattan, and Marv's name was in her address book with his phone number. Now, all of these things were acts among consenting adults. Nobody was hurt, except maybe Marv, but Marv went through the ringer. Subsequently, he made a comeback. He's back on top again. But when Marv first came back, he was exiled. He was fired by NBC. He was fired by MSG. This is a guy who was sportscasting royalty. And for more than a year, he was completely out of work. He finally got a job working for MSG Network doing the 11 o'clock p.m. sports news where probably he had, what, 200 people watching each show. It was an incredible come down, but he realized that that was a necessary step in his rehabilitation. I thought the whole thing was interesting. I asked the New Yorker, which is an esteemed publication, top of the line, are you interested in my writing an article for Talk of the Town, which is their common section at the beginning of the magazine, about more of Albert's comeback? And they said, we'd love it, but he's not giving interviews. He gave one interview to People magazine, which his fiance Heather Faulkner was working for, and that's not it. He's not giving any more interviews. And I figured, well, why don't I give it a try? So I contacted Marv through Madison Square Garden. And Marv, to, to everybody's surprise, said, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. I've read your stuff. Yeah, I know your work. I trust you. So I went in, you know, spent that evening with Marv, wrote my piece for Talk of the Town for the New Yorker, and the way they work then is they edit things and they send it back to you. And uh, I'm reading my piece that I wrote, and they have added a reference to Marv Albert's toupee, which I thought was totally gratuitous, unnecessary. What's the point of this? It's just a nasty, snarky, snide remark. So I called up and I said, number one, it's not a toupee, it's a hair weave. And number two, I mean, what's the point of this? This doesn't belong in the article. Well, we think it's funny. I said, I don't think it's funny. Well, we do. So they gave me a choice. They said, we can either run the article the way it is, with the hair weave reference in, or we'll kill the article, which I wasn't real happy about because the New Yorker is a prize assignment. It's a high prestige assignment but I had a relationship on the line. So I called up Marv, and I told him exactly what happened. I said, you know, if you want me to, I'll kill this. You know, uh, he said, well, I mean, that's not fear. I said, no, I said, no, look, you trusted me, and that's more important to me than this article. And I read him both versions. I read him what I'd written, I read him what the New Yorker wrote, and he said, well, look, I like your version better, but after everything I've been through, somebody making a snide reference about my hair weave is not the end of the world. So we ran the article, but it also preserved the relationship and preserved the relationship with anybody else Marv might talk to. 14, use the same standard of care for everything you write. I'm frequently asked by young boxing writers, because I do a lot of boxing writing these days, if I have any tips for them as to things that they should know about writing boxing. And I say, yeah, I'll tell you three things. Number one, if there's free food, grab it. <laughs> Number two, all fighters are nuts. I mean, you gotta be, they can be some of the nicest, most wonderful, spectacular people in the world, but you really gotta be a little nuts to be a fighter. And number three, your article is on the line, your reputation, I should say, is on the line with every article you write. It becomes part of your creative legacy. You don't know who's gonna come across it, when they're gonna come across it, and judge you by it. So treat every article with care. And last, don't become a writer for the money because for most writers, the business isn't very profitable. You can get lucky, you, know, you can score well, some people have nice careers with it, but there are a lot of ways you can make more money. Your greatest satisfaction in being a writer 
will be as a creative artist in writing well, in getting published, and in having fun. And on that fun note, I'd like to close with another Muhammad Ali story, uh, and which you know, I'd put up there with his flight attendant story is, is probably my two favorite Ali stories. Ali was a wonderful man in so many ways. He was not expert when it came to geopolitical matters. And there was a time in the 1980s when he was in England for the opening of a supermarket. Some people had paid him to go over there. And uh, the people in England loved him as they did everywhere. You know, they were crowding around. They wanted hugs and kisses. You didn't have cell phones yet, so there were no selfies. But there were autographs and you know, people, more and more and more people. And Ali turned to Jerry Eisenberg, who was probably the greatest sports writer of the last half century, and said, these people in England are so nice, I'll bet in their whole history they never had a war. <laughs> Thank you. Later on, we'll do it later. We'll do it later. Thank you very much, Mr. Hauser. Thank you. Cindy Tangora graduated from Mercy College in 2001. She had planned for a career in journalism, but after an internship with the Department of Communication for the city of New Rochelle, she started to become aware of new opportunities. After working successful with her supervisor, Ms. Tangora was offered a freelance opportunity. Her responsibilities included overseeing the city's communications with the public, photography, and writing copy for city announcements and bulletins. Shortly after graduating, Ms. Uh, Ms. Tangora secured a position at Mercy College as a press secretary, where she continued to refine her skills as a writer, photographer, and communicator. Several years later, Cindy accepted a position as promotions manager for Manhattanville College, and then promotions manager for Pace University Law School. Currently, Cindy is program coordinator at Columbia Law School, where she uses her writing, media communication, and photography skills daily. Cindy continues to write and take photographs for college functions and is involved with newsletter and website promotional activity. Her photography has elevated to such a level that she won two separate contests sponsored by the greeting card company Hallmark and an honorable mention by the Wildlife Conservation Society. Cindy has photographed notable country music artists such as Terry Clark and Charles Esteem. I think I said that right. Esteem. <laughs> her work in this area includes album and live on stage portraits t-shirt images, and numerous other promotional photos. She manages to travel the country to take such photos while maintaining her current position at the Columbia Law School. When asked how she does this, her response is, it's all about the scheduling. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this year's Quill Award for Outstanding Alumna goes to Ms. Cindy Tangor. Good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight. Congratulations to Tom Hauser, and most importantly, congratulations to the Student Quill Award recipients. I want to thank Lou Grosso for this award. It's a wonderful honor, but it's the students that, are the true, um, that deserve the true honor tonight. My time as a student at Mercy College was a great time in my life. When I was younger, I was an introvert and shy. If I tell people that now, they laugh and they don't believe me. So what changed? Mercy helped me gain the confidence to figure out who I was and what I was good at. I started out as a veterinary technology major. I thought that would be the right program for me. I learned quickly this was not true, and that was OK. The college experience is all about finding yourself and what you want to do with your life. When I realized I didn't want to continue with the vet tech program, I did not give up. I decided to lean on what I did well, and that was writing. I thought about majoring in English when I found Mayor Hall in the Journalism and Media Department. The rest, I guess you could say, is history. 
I excelled and found where my passion and skills were best applied. I always thought I would be a reporter after I graduated. That too changed when I took a job in the communications office here at Mercy. Public relations has always been in my blood. I love to promote everything I care about. It also allowed me to focus on my photography. Every PR person needs good photos, and I could use that skill to my advantage. The one thing I hope you take away from my story is to never give up. And if something doesn't work out, that is OK. Be open to finding out what you're passionate about and trust your instincts. My current job at Columbia Law School is mainly administrative, but I also coordinate events, design posters, and edit newsletters for the Kernikan Center for Law, Media, and the Arts. Since it's largely a nine to five type position, the j this job has allowed me the freedom to travel and follow my passion for taking live photos across the country and into Canada. The artist I photograph the most is Terry Clark, a country music star and the only female Canadian member of the Grand Old Opry. Terry has used my work on her website. My photo appeared in her most recent CD, Some Songs, and she has even personally asked me to take a photo that appeared across Canada on her promotional ads for her 41 show tour. I believe it was my accomplishments and photo work for Terry that allowed Lou to consider me for this honor. It is amazing and full circle for me since it was Lou who was the Terry Clark fan first. He gave me a copy of the album Just the Same many years ago, and I thought it would be most appropriate to present him with a signed and personalized copy of that album, along with some songs, which has my work and photo credit included. There's a hat here, too. And Terry knows. <laughs> <laughs> I had to give, bring you something too, so. <laughs> Terry was sorry she couldn't be here tonight, so. <laughs> but she says you should come to a show. Finally, I would like to thank my family. My mother passed away in November, but I know she is looking down proudly right now. I want to also thank my father, Frank, my aunt, Joni, and my brother, Mark. And my cousins are also here tonight. Thank you, Donna, Joe, Alyssa, and Victoria. I truly appreciate your love and support. Alyssa graduated from Mercy, so she is a proud Mercy alum, too. Congrats, Alyssa. Thank you all so much. And remember, follow your dreams and your passions. They won't steer you in the wrong direction. I haven't listened to that album in a long time, but I'm going to listen to it again. <laughs> I remember hearing that on the radio, saying, this is pretty good. What is this? Who is this? And I looked it up, and I bought the album, and it was very good. The whole album was very good, I thought. Anyway, we're moving on now to the student awards, which is what you're here for. And this next man needs no introduction. The man who teaches journalism at Mercy College. He is our department chair of the communication and the arts department. Please welcome Professor Michael Parada. <laughs> Take it. I didn't get drafted by the NFL. Take it easy. Okay. So, as I'm going through our awards with where I want to start, the winner of our first award always tells me, you talk too much at these things. And here, when I'm supposed to talk a lot about her, I guess that means I'm just not going to, but <laughs> kind of locked into it, and I really look forward to finding her award. If it comes up, it's here. It's here. It's here. It's here. It's here. It's here. Okay. No. No. Yes. Maybe. Where's the excellence? Where's the excellence? Single the excellence. It should be in that stack. It's in there, not on the top, not on the top. No, I got photography on top. Photography and then excellence in journalism you're looking for? Yeah. Right. Okay. This happens every year. <laughs> 
we'll go with what we got here. You know. So, having said that, let's start with feature writing, okay? Because that's where we were supposed to start, right? So what is feature writing? Feature writing is finding a topic, finding a person that wouldn't normally be in the media, in the news, someone you maybe meet all the time, but don't really realize that there's something special about it. Maybe that Vietnam veteran, maybe that uh, person who lived through the Great Depression, maybe that guy who lives next to you that's, you know, raises bees for a living and, and does crazy things. And it's about finding a person, making a connection to your audience and capturing emotion. And after a student or after a user has kind of done reading that story, they say, I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I just opened myself up to the leisure of it and, and, and was introduced to a new topic. So the following students that I'm going to kind of introduce have really done a, an excellent job uh, either in feature writing classes or in the college publication. So our first uh, winner of feature writing is Katrine Thoreau. Katrine? Come on. Is spirit. Is Tanisha here? Okay. She's at the NFL draft. Board. Harriet Sim. Amy Morales Lara, is Amy here? I think. Amy? No? Yes? We miss you, we love you, okay. Matthew Wright, Matthew. Like the end of a 70s sitcom at the end of the night. Yeah, it would freeze. Andrew, is Andrea Lewise in here? Andrea. Andrea. Okay. No problem. Mm, Marissa Miano. Okay. I beat it. I think he just went. Yeah. Uh, next award is for news reporting, and you know we're gathering facts, we're talking to sources, we're trying to make sense of um, difficult situations, difficult problems. You know, we are the gatekeepers of information, and, and we need to relay, you know, to the students or, or to the users to, to you know what they should be learning from this issue. What question, you know, we have to come up with what questions should we be asking? You know, we're, we're thirsty for knowledge, we're thirsty for answers, and, and we keep fighting and we, and, and we keep going, and, and that's what kind of drives a news reporter. So, um, following students, uh, Danielle Saransky, Saransky. Jessica Brandt, Jessica. Uh, Olivia Meyer, Olivia. No. Okay. Okay. Next Quill Award is for magazine production. We have a magazine class where we study the industry, whether it's in print, whether it's in digital. We actually talk about finances. We talk about how advertising works, how articles work, how the demographics of a magazine works and, and really something that I'm trying to instill in my students where sometimes you just have to write a, write a story and, and kind of figure out where to place it afterwards and sometimes there's some strategy to how you write your story. There's how many words are you going? Who are you targeting? That's how you know you kind of understand 
if you're going to be right for that magazine. And at the end, the students came up with a project where they had to develop their own magazine. They, they needed a business plan. They needed a, 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 um, an editorial calendar, who was going to be on their cover. So they put a lot of effort into this, and, and a few students did a, did a really outstanding job. I'd like to honor them. So the first is Nora Grace Arose. This student's project was on a magazine about bacon, was it, Ronington? <laughs> so, how do you turn down a magazine about bacon? Roddington Jones. I mean, I, I mean, you know, I mean, what? I don't even have to. Mag magazine that sold itself. Being a pain in the rump. That's what it was. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Here we are. Okay. Okay. No. Nope. Video for the. Way. Okay. Uh, next are for students who were instrumental in taking our print and digital stories and creating them into video. So these are the journalism students who are working on um, behind the you know behind the scenes producing, um, shooting with camera, editing. So first couple students we like to bring up is. Lane Griffin. Congratulations, Lane. Thank you. Karen Polanco. Oh. You're supposed to pretend like you're excited. Chloe DeGiani. I'm take a picture. Oh. <laughs> Beat it. Okay, let's see what's next. Nope. Nope. Okay, this next award is for what I like to call exploratory journalism, where story and the ideas are a little bit outside, outside the box. It's not what, you know, kind of what's presented in front of you. And you come up with some really creative ideas of, of, of your coverage, of the types of stories you write. And this next journalist has all of a sudden fallen into this, this knack of finding a protest, getting involved in it, and writing about it and becoming part of it. And, and you know, I, there's protests for things I've never even heard of before. And she's like, no, nah, I'm going. I'm in that. And, and OK. So, uh, for exploratory journalism is uh, Brittany Hubrosh. Our next award is for uh, our entertainment writers. And, and this student took a, a summer course with me where we were, you know, critiquing art is one of the most difficult things. I worked as a, as a critic for, for a long time, from music to books and, and movies. And, and you're really trying to be honest with yourself and, and honest with the artist, and also at the same time understand why they were creating that art and, and, and if the audience can, could, could accept the message that was, that was, that was being approached. And this student really did, did such an excellent job over the summer. Uh, Christine Coleman. Thank you, Christine. Pleasure. It's okay. Perfect. Perfect. What I'm gonna say. So there's a priest, a rabbi, and a monk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So 
Back to my opening. Remember like five minutes ago, I was talking about that person who didn't want me to talk? Well, let's go back to that. And so, every year, uh, we give an Excellence in Journalism Award. And it's a very competitive nature, and, and students you know, understand what it takes to win this award and, and how important it is. And, and it's really a, a show of faith that, that this department really believes in the work you've done and, and that you're going to have a very successful career. And, and this student over, over the past you know, three years uh, has just, you know, her potential just continues to grow and grow, and, and the quality of her stories just continues to, to improve. And, you know, first she was, you know, 15 years, 9-11 um, anniversary, and, and she had said, I want to I go down there. I, I want to meet these survivors. I, I want to see how people are coping 15 years later. And, you know, last year we lost an alumni of the program. He died in, in Florida um, on a boat trying to save his friend. And she said, I want that story. That's the story. She's always the person who's willing to, to, to tackle that story and want that story. And she's very deserving of, of this award, and she's going to have a wonderful career. Elena Griffin. <laughs> Did I say those things? <laughs> All right, get out of here. Get out of here. I don't see him. I don't see him. Column writing. You know, students get an opportunity to have their own column at the impact, and they really kind of relish it and take advantage of it and, and get to have fun and they get to talk about you know, who they are in their lives and, and the things that they explore. And, and one of our more colorful ones was, you know, when, goes by the alias Kiki. And, and you know, so we're a big fan of Kimberly Franco's column. So Kimberly Franco, is she here? Yes. Kiki, let's go! I've never known you to hide in the back, Kiki. So, congratulations. Now beat it. Also, in, in the quill for column is actually, it's interesting sometimes the people that the newspaper attracted, you know, you see your journalists and, and you see the people who are in production, and sometimes you get someone from an outside major who brings a different perspective to this paper. So this student is actually an accounting major, so I mean, let's make sure our, make sure our, our, our budgets are in order. Uh, she's also wonderful at, at looking at the world from a different perspective, and every publication needs that. So Abigail Smith. Just when you wanted me to be done, I'm not done yet. Oh, I know. I know. But I'll make it quick. Last year, the Impact won the second most writing awards in the New York Press Association with four. Uh, that's second most in the state of New York. And that was the first time we've ever done anything to, to see that number. And, and we thought we'd, we'd never see that number again. And, and we said, well, OK, well, now we got really high expectations because we're going to have to beat that number the next year. And, and we didn't beat that number, but we ended up tying it and winning another four awards and, again, winning the second most writing awards in the state of New York. So we'll certainly take that. So I'd love to now honor the winners of the New York Press Association Award. And, and I remember winning a New Jersey Press Association Award early in my career, and it just changed my career. And it was just something I'd always um, you know, dreamed about. It. And this is so important for these students. So first, New York Press Association Award, I'm going to you know, bring up are actually a team of three students you know, in the editorial department where you know, every newspaper in, in New York kind of presents you know, those opportunities where the staff takes a look at an issue and they, you know, just like our guest speaker had said, and stresses their opinion <laughs> surrounded by facts. And we had you know, an article about um, uh, how important a night, an evening like Take Back the Night is and students' responsibility to be there. And we had it important about women's consent. And we had you know, all these interesting editorials. And I'd like to uh, bring up, as the team, you know, we have a team of three. For third place in the state of New York for best editorial team is Brittany Lee, Asani Jackson, and Tiffany Cordero.
And I say, did I, did I say third? I meant second place in the state of New York. My apologies. I, did I say third? So that's for you. And that's for you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Take a picture. Take a picture. Now, this story has such an interesting background. Um, two reporters, they were just kind of starting out, and I threw them one of the most difficult projects we had ever kind of worked on, and they said, oh, are you sure with us with this story? And I said, yes, absolutely. So these two reporters were kind of tasked with the opportunity to write about, you know, part of our Mercy students who went over to Palestine and were teaming up with Israeli, um, uh, Israeli uh, college students who were teaming up with Palestinian college students, and, and they were, you know, working on cleaning the environment, and they were working together, and, and when they, ca they came back, it, it was a very controversial article, and and they said, oh my, I, I never knew how difficult this could be and, and all the backlash and, and did we do it right? And I said, yes, I said, you did it right. You did your job. I said, don't ever think that you didn't even though sometimes the public doesn't understand how this job is supposed to be done. And, and then they kind of turned around and they said, thank God this is over. And I said, well, don't worry, it'll pay off in the end. And a few months later, they turned out writing the second best news story in the state of New York. So Faith Rodriguez and Christine Casalon. So back to that topic of column writing, um, our first winner is the third best columnist in the state of New York, and she writes a very heartfelt column. The, the comments of, from the judges about her column was, you know, she writes from the heart and personal experience, and everyone can relate to that, and that's exactly what a columnist is supposed to do. And the judge had said, I, I can see myself in these situations because I've been in these situations. And that's how you maintain a column. And for the third uh, best columnist in the state of New York is Veronica Roxa. How about that? Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, last one. Stale in that column, and for those of you that aren't following these columns on theimpactnews.com, which I'll plug and pops up every now and then, um, not only do you have the third best columnist uh, in the state, there, there was even a higher finisher than that, and, you know, the columns on this student, on, on this was, you know, this columnist wrote a very moving piece about the loss of her grandmother, and she actually said, I was crying by the time I finished reading the article. And after she said, there's no way I couldn't not have won this. And, and when you win first place, you actually get a plaque. So here we go. And ironically, the title of her column is Winner Take All. And she actually did that. So the top ranked columnist in the state of New York is our managing editor of the paper, Kayla Simon. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm done. I'm finished. You've had enough of me. Once again, the man who makes this happen for the past 20 years, Louis Grasso. I understand, Kayla. I understand. <laughs> okay, up next is a film culture. Uh, Professor Stephen DeRosa is kind enough to hand out all the awards for all the film culture classes. Please welcome Professor Steve DeRosa. He also teaches uh, in, in this film culture program as well. So please welcome Professor Stephen DeRosa. <laughs> Thank you. 
I've also been told that I can go on for some time here, so I'm going to be very brief as well. Um, it's a truism that uh, film is a reflection of the culture and vice versa. In guiding students in their discovery of film, it's my aim and that of my colleagues who also teach in the film and culture concentration to awaken students to a deeper understanding, something more than an appreciation of any individual film or any individual filmmaker's canon. I believe it's the responsibility of the student of film to act as interpreter, uh, to be a conduit between uh, the film artist and the film goer. Who seeks, to be, uh, who seeks more than just to be entertained during a movie's running time. The film scholar must be respectful and critical of past work, open-minded and maybe a bit dubious about the present, and perhaps most importantly, optimistic about the future of film. The students being recognized this evening have demonstrated each of these traits, and I'm happy to say that many of them have been in one or more of uh, my own classes. Beginning with uh, the Hollywood Western, I was going to make a joke about La La Land, but you know, it's, if you all saw the Oscars this year, you, you know. Right? Um, so for the Hollywood Western, Ashley Rivera. Continuing on the Hollywood Western, Roddington Jones. <laughs> and also the Hollywood Western, Helen Wilkin. Helen here. Moving on to European trends in cinema, Darian Green. <laughs> For the language of film, we have several awards this evening. Francesca Gonzalez. Good to see you. Waddington Jones. <laughs> you magazine about bacon? Yes, I did. It was important to me. <laughs> Congratulations. Karen Polanco. Surprise. This is for the, all the ahs every time about it. I was here on the corner when uh, oh, there was yeah. always be something in a movie and it was, do it. Could you do it? No. No? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And I'll hand it over to Professor Glossop. Thank you, Professor DeRosa. Up next is uh, Professor John Masevich. Professor Masevich, as you know, teaches video editing and audio production, radio production, uh, uh, understanding media technology, uh, special effects and television. He's, uh, he's the go-to guy in the television production and radio production area. Please welcome Professor John Masevich. <laughs> Not that bad. Um, so, you know, usually I, I, you know, I'm the king of brevity as the soul of wit because I'm the resident fat guy and usually you don't feed me till after this is done, but since you fed me already, I got no reason to take my hand it up. So let me just start. Oh, wow. Oddly enough, this, this is a radio award, the first one I'm going to actually hand out. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about everyone because I, I certainly could, but... Um, 
this one person, really, uh, I just want to start off with, with this one particular person because she, uh, I'm telling you, if you just stick to it, this is really, I mean, I would go up into the radio lab, she'd be there. And, you know, I'm, just about any time, I'm just sticking to it, sticking with it. So last semester when I was asked um, if I would do a, a guided project, well, and I said, yeah, no problem. So um, this is actually an award in radio journalism, and it goes to Sarai Acevedo. <laughs> So on to video editing, and and um, uh, so video editing. Uh, we can talk a lot about this, and believe me, I won't, I won't, you know, kill you about this. But it, here's one of the things I just want to remind everybody, and this, this is true of, of everything. Um, you, you know, just don't forget because so, some of these people are going to be graduating, and you know. Uh, some of them I get to abuse, I mean teach for a few more years. Um, so th those of you who are leaving, I just want to remind you that you know this is, this is just the jump off point. This isn't the end, this is just the beginning. And you know, if I did my job right, if we did our jobs right, we taught you how to learn. And you pick up the ball and you run with it from here. And um, editing is one of those things, the technology keeps changing over, but the aesthetic you know, that, that modifies, but it doesn't really change that much. I mean, we can argue that philosophically, but, um, you know, I always tell people it's like driving a car. If you, you know, not endorsing anyone, but if you learned how to drive on a Honda Civic, that doesn't mean you can only drive on a Honda Civic. It doesn't mean you go back to driving school and learn how, learn how to do it, do it, how to drive a Toyota something or other, or a Ford or a Chevy. Um, maybe you got to learn where the, you know, the radio is and where, you know, Maybe you have to learn how to drive stick if you knew how to drive automatic, but rules of the road are basically the same. Um, so with that, my first editing award goes to uh, Veronica Bacha. Answer everything. And those of you who know Veronica just know, you know, you can't do a Veronica award without doing a Kayla Songs uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just can't top that uh, top writer in the state award. Uh, I don't know if this per next person's here. Uh, is Jack is on here? No, Jack. That one's going twice. Jack? Nope. Okay. Well, you could applaud for him anyway. Uh, Shaquille Hawkins? <laughs> applaud for him anyway. Uh, I saw this person earlier. I hope he's still here. Uh, Brendan Carey. <laughs> This, this next person, uh, before I move on, I just wanted to say that this, this was somebody that came out of, uh, out of another program and had a sense of, of, of editing, um, at least sound. And, um, but it was a good jump off point. And we had, there's this one project that we, we do, with, and you know, we affectionately call it Two Idiots on a Couch. And uh, yeah, those two guys, yeah. Um, but we, we added something to it, and I'll, I hope I never forget what this person says. He took this footage, he cut it in a way that really was sort of different than anyone had ever cut it. And I asked him, why did you do that? And this is the answer. And I hope I really never forget this, and, and I wish I could convey this. I really, if I can teach this to everyone, then I've really done my job. Simple answer. He said it felt right. 
And that was the best answer he could possibly give. So, um, at the risk of butchering his name yet again, Serene, <laughs> Serene, got it. Get, we're, don't worry, we're getting, we're getting to the bottom. Yeah, so two more classes. There is an advanced editing level, and um, I don't think um, this next person is actually here. And sorry, the tie keeps having a mind of its own. Um, is John P. Powers here? Yes. He is here. Thank you, John P. You snuck in on me. Shari Sakari here, or she really couldn't make it for real? Well, you can applaud for Shari anyway. <laughs> now, the last award in advanced editing, which by the way, the, the purpose of advanced editing is in level one, you learn how to, you learn the rules. And in level two, we try to break the rules as much as we can and still make everything make sense. So I just want to say one thing about this person and, um, another person just sticking to it um, and has just expressed in, in the work, you know, feels right. But I, I just have to say this, and this is going to be, it's going to sound like such an out and left feel and a couple people might understand this. I, there's a certain Led Zeppelin song I will never be able to listen to again without thinking of this person because um, I don't have really cool names for, for my awards, you know. I mean, I, you know, I always think about the Eisenstein Award for montage or the grip of the award for continuity or something like this. I'm just going to call this the Land of the Ice and Snow um, award for editing. Miriam Odegaard. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Don't worry. There's just two more classes, don't worry. I teach a few things, what can I tell you? All right, so moving kind of a little quickly. Um, is uh, Cicely Stanek here? You. That's not. Uh, this next person I know is here. Let me just put that on. I'd least like to have one person. Um, uh, again, Andrea Eliza, uh, is she? not here. Can applaud. And we know Shari uh, isn't here. Shari Sakari also. So the, the one last remaining person that actually I know is here is um, Karen Polanco. All right, so finally the last group, I promise you, this is the last group. Um, just see. So this was a class that we, um, that I, a little background. This was um, something that kind of got inspired by, all right, I was watching the Disney Channel, and I was watching Liv and Maddie, and I thought it was so cool because they, they it's one of those twin shows, if any of you are old enough to remember the Patty Duke show, it's kind of, you know, a, a newer spin on that. But, um, and I said to Lou, I go, Lou, why don't you try doing these particular shots? He said, oh, why don't you teach a class doing it? I go, okay. And after, you know, about a year back and forth and putting things together um, and coming up with some ideas and maybe, you know, a little grander than, than, you know, I had kind of been able to com kind of completely pull off. But, um, so what we've done is, is we've kind of done the non-standard stuff, uh, some special effects things. And um, I hope people uh, do more of this stuff in the future. But the first person uh, to receive the award 
is not here. And once again, Shari Sakari, who is just uh, somewhere, I don't know where she is. Um, is Taylor Carter here? Taylor? Taylor, me? Where are you? Taylor Carter. Um, Carolyn Newman. So, yeah. Okay. I almost feel like this person I should have a special category for, so, or I should have had a special category for, but um, she's always got some great input to give. Um, and she's one of the people I, I expect a lot out of. And sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes uh, I let her I let her slide a little bit on certain things, um, but she makes up for it in other ways, and that's Deanna Capers. <laughs> and finally. Last award I have tonight, and it just kind of brings it full circle for me. Um, and all the presentations tonight, Sarai Acevedo. And Professor Grasso. Thank you, Professor Basevich. We come to the last category, the very last category, which is television production. And that's what I do here at the college. And I have a few classes of awards here I'd like to give out. Uh, the first is for fundamentals of television production. In fundamentals of television production, students are really coming in contact within a TV studio in a live environment for the first time. They're producing shows, uh, talk shows basically. But we do about maybe 30 shows for the semester, including uh, rehearsals and everything. So it, it's, it's great to see them come together and run the studio by the end of the semester and produce these three minute talk shows. And uh, the first one goes to Roddington Jones. I do. <laughs> the next up is Francesca Gonzalez. Francesca Gonzalez. I forget about you, Francesca. Yeah. Next up, Daniela, Danielle Saraski. Danielle, where's Danielle? Where's she? You're so tall. You're so I know. Beautiful. Next up is Christy Harrison. Okay. Uh, Tavisha Beaton. Tavisha, Tavisha. Next, uh, Denisha, oh, no, wrong award. This is a wrong award. How did this get in here? This was for Steve DeRosa. Steve, you have more awards to get. <laughs> okay, we'll come back to you. I don't know how they got mixed up. You're going to come back. No, no, I got video. I got video. Okay, the next class is TV. <laughs> I don't want to mix up the genres. 
The next thing is TV studio production. This is where students get into the studio and they start to work in a fictional narrative setting. In other words, they're working with a script, they're working with storyboards, they're following a plan. The first class, they're really ad-libbing. Okay, but this time they really have to uh, tightly rehearse scenes. Uh, this is TV studio production. Kaylee Stevens, Kaylee Stevens. Carly's not here, okay, no Carly. Next up is Marissa Miano. Okay. Okay, and the next the next category is advanced television studio production. In advanced television studio production, here's where students now start to write and formulate their own scripts, their own ideas, and they storyboard them, and, well, sometimes they do. They storyboard them, and uh, they select the actors, and they select all the production people to do the jobs, and they're really responsible for doing the overall production. Uh, we have uh, Chelsea Martin. Chelsea Martin. Yeah. Chelsea was the assistant director for just about everybody in that class. Matthew Reich, Matthew Reich. <laughs> Matt's performances are always top notch. Miriam Oldegaard. I equate Miriam with easy squeezy. Everything's easy for her. Oh no, we'll make it work. Don't worry about it. Let's just do it. That's Miriam's attitude. And she'll really go far with that attitude because, you know, she can make anything work for her. Okay, Caroline Newman. <laughs> Caroline's another one. You throw her in any environment and she'll perform whether it's camera, directing, whatever she does it. Roddington Jones. <laughs> Roddington has helped me build more sets in the TV studio than I think anybody else. <laughs> Catherine Halecki. Chloe DiGiani. Inside you. <laughs> Taylor Carter, of course. <laughs> Just don't get Taylor angry, she'll throw her phone at you. <laughs> okay, uh, last, last uh, group right here is video documentary. Students in this class are tying together a bunch of skills they've learned over the, over the years, over the semesters. It's studio production, it's field production, it's video editing, and in this class they're tying all those skills together to produce or to, to learn about video documentary. Uh, let's see what we got here. We got Deanna Capers, Deanna Capers. <laughs> Okay, Terry Jones, where's TJ? <laughs> Cody Bolanos, where's Cody? Another can-do attitude. You give something to Cody, it gets done. 
See? It goes like that. It gets done. Oh, keys are here. And last but not least is oh, Gino's not here either. Okay. So we have two more awards to go. Steve, you want to come up and do give them with me? Is Denise here? Denise here? These are the ones I got lost in the pile. This is for fundamentals of writing for film and TV. Denisha Massey? Denisha Massey is not here? <laughs> Denisha Massey. That's the golden age of cinema, Denisha, Denisha Massey. <laughs> well, hold on. Okay. We'll put them there. So much for that. Uh, I, I wanna, this brings us to the end of the, uh, the Quill Awards for this year. I want to thank you all for coming. I also want to let you know that uh, Alexa is here to take photos with you and other people with your awards if you like. Uh, I want to thank uh, Tom Hauser who had to leave. He had another engagement actually. Uh, I want to thank Cindy Tangora and her family of course for coming and being a part of this. Uh, I want to thank the faculty presenters of the Quill Awards. But most of all, most of all, I want to thank the students that participate in the program and excel in their coursework. So without you, we don't exist. Thank you. So have a good night, and hopefully I'll see you again next year. There's more food. Eat it. <laughs>